After proving that the texts of Vatican II are ambiguous, as I hope I did in the first volume of this collection, how should we continue the analysis of the Council? In principle, when the text of a document is confusing, we normally try to determine the spirit of the author who wrote it in order to understand what he wanted to teach. This method is often uh, applied to laws. When a law is not sufficiently clear to orient the lawyer defending a cause or the judge issuing a sentence on it, the lawyer or judge must study the spirit of the law to see how the text should be applied. For example, the work by Montesquieu, De l'Esprit de Loi, about the spirit of laws, which greatly influenced the French Revolution, sets out the basic principles of laws and institutions that model the modern state. When there is no clear statement of principles, the spirit of the law is determined by how it has been applied by the courts and accepted by the people. In this collection about the Vatican II, I applied a similar criterion. Since the letter of the documents is ambiguous, I try to determine the spirit of the Council in order to interpret the ambiguous parts of the documents. So, from Volume 2 to Volume 5, I analyze the spirit of Vatican II. I believe that this is more important than the study of the letter of the documents because it explains not only the documents, but the entire, entire legacy of the Council. Father Carl Runner, one of the theologians and the greatest contributor of the writings in the writings of the documents of the Council, confirmed this. He said, What is most important in this Council is not the letter of the decrees it promulgated. They still need to be translated into life and action by all of us. Its spirit, its more advanced tendencies, this is what is the most important. So, in the next four volumes, I studied the mentality that was unleashed by the Council and became increasingly manifest inside the Catholic Church. How can this mentality or state of spirit be defined? First, it can be defined as the adoption by the conciliar and post-conciliar leaders of an attitude of tolerance toward error and evil, as well as toward their agents. In the Council's opening speech, John XXIII described this new approach as a manifestation of mercy that should spread the Church's love in order to unite mankind, referring to the world and false religions. Second, the state of spirit born at the Council can be defined as the adoption of a hostile attitude toward the militancy of the Catholic Church, both past and present. Indeed, this tolerance for error and evil inevitably generated a remarkable hostility toward the previous Catholic militancy. That is, it created hostility toward the main characteristic of, Holy, of the Holy Catholic Church, which imitates our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, Do not think that I came to send peace upon earth. I came not to send peace, but the sword. Third, the state of spirit born at the Council can be defined as the adoption of a hostile attitude against the sacral and hierarchical characteristics of the Holy Catholic Church. Since I will be using the words sacral and sacrality, let me open a parenthesis in this presentation and give the viewer of this DVD a brief explanation of what sacrality 
and the sacral characteristic of the church are. I offer you a metaphor. When we enter a medieval cathedral, there are two things that strike our senses and our souls. The structure of the building with the strict order of its different parts and the internal ambience established by that structure with its, with its great silence that once in a while is broken by the majestic sound of the tower bells, its solemn obscurity illuminated here and there by the colored rays streaming through the stained glass windows, which let us glimpse statues of saints in their niches. And our skin also feels the freshness coming from the stone walls and columns. The structure reflects the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, while the ambience is a symbol of her sacrality. This sacrality is amplified when a ceremony takes place inside of that building. Then we can hear the sound of the organ and the small bells of the altar. Our eyes admire the vestments of the priest, the altar cloths and its sacred vessels, the candelabra with the, their glowing candles, and the ornamental vases with flowers. We can also smell the incense and see its mysterious vapors in the air. All of those feelings that impress our bodily senses correspond to analogous sentiments in our soul. So, the structure of the cathedral symbolizes the hierarchy of the Catholic Church while the ensemble of these material and spiritual impressions expresses her sacrality. Now that we know what sacrality is, as well as its link with hierarchy, I close the parenthesis and repeat the third characteristic of the mindset of the Council. Third, the state of spirit born at the Council can be defined as the adoption of a hostile position against the sacral and hierarchy characteristics of the Holy Catholic Church. The rationale for this is that once tolerance toward error and evil is admitted, the Church, instead of combating the fundamental errors, errors of the world, should adapt to the world in its vulgarity and egalitarianism. Thus, it implies a conflict with the characteristics of the Church that oppose the world, that is, her sacral and hierarchical notes. So, in brief, I would summarize by saying that the spirit of the Council is tolerance for evil and hostility toward the Church's militancy sacrality and hierarchical character. This definition is supported by the following facts. It is consistent with the general orientation of the pontificate of John XXIII, which was faithfully followed by Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Francis I. It explains the dogmatic relativism and moral laxity that have pervaded the interpretation of the Catholic doctrine since the Council. It explains the general climate of conciliar reforms in regard to both the desacralization of the Church and the dissolution of her hierarchical structure. It explains ecumenism the adaptation of the Church to false religions, and secular, secularization, the adaptation of the Church to the world, both notable characteristics of the conciliar era. It sheds light on innumerable ambiguities of the official documents. This, then, 
is how I would define the spirit of the council. Now, this spirit of tolerance toward error and evil will be analyzed in the next four volumes of my collection. To demonstrate this hostility against militancy, sacrality and hierarchy, I adopted a general method that follows the normal procedures of lawyers and judges. Indeed, in criminal law, when the lawyer cannot bring to light precise evidence to incriminate the defendant, he looks, for, looks at his animus, his state of mind, expressed by the indirect symptoms that reveal his will to commit a crime, for example, murder. In court, these symptoms are called circumstantial evidence. Thus, if the defendant constantly offended the victim, this, act, this attitude uh, weighs in the process to prove his culpability. If he, co he constantly affirm that he wanted to kill the victim, this also aggravates the charges against him. In my readings, I found about 700 offensive texts from the pens of those theologians who wrote the documents of Vatican II. So, I grouped them together under the name Animus Injuriendi, the intent or desire to offend. Volumes 2 and 3 report these offenses. In Volume 2, Animus Injuriandi 1, I listed the offenses against the Catholic Church as she was until Vatican II. This is the first block of offenses. The second block, which will be dealt with in Volume 3, <coughs> points to injuries against the doctrine of the Church, not against her constitution and history. I also found a large number of texts showing their desire to destroy the Church, which is translated in Latin as Animus Delendi. Volumes 4 and 5 expose the plans to destroy the Church that are partially revealed by those progressive theologians and prelates who held important positions during the Council and after it. More particularly, in this volume 2, Animus Injuriandi 1, I report on those who accuse the past militancy of the Church as being infamous, cruel, and sadistic. The sacrality of her rites and ceremonies were qualified as stupid pretensions, and her devotions as manifestations of fanaticism. Her sanctity was described as pharisaic and narcissistic, her form of government as tyrannical and absolutist. The venerable past customs of the Church were considered as inspired by the heresies of Pelagianism, Jansenism, and the Docetism. Her holy discipline was accused of being shaped by Stoicism, Manichaeism, and even Sadomasochism. Her devotions to the Pope was called an unbearable papolatry or idolatry of the, for the Pope, of the Pope. The past language of the Church was considered esoteric and her thinking derived from fantasy and myths. The past separation of the Church from the state made her a sect and doomed her to a ghetto situation. So her relationship with the state was characterized as schizophrenic. I, separate, I separated these many offenses into groups 
and placed them in different chapters so that the reader can evaluate for himself the amount of hatred that inspired the Vatican II theologians. This is a general plan of Volume II, Animus Injuriandi I. So far, we have acquired these notions, what the spirit of the Council is, and how to investigate its animus injuriandi, that is, its intention to injure the Catholic Church. Now let me go on to give some examples of these offenses, so that the viewer may evaluate the hatred of, for the Church that inspired the progressivist theologians and prelates who were at work at Vatican II and thenceforth influenced the post-conciliar era. The first set of examples regards the militancy of the Church. Of the essential attributes of the Catholic Church, her militant character is certainly the one that raises the most hatred of progressivists, even more than the, her monarchical and fundamentally non-egalitarian character and her sacral nature, her militancy is the keel of the bark of Peter that presupposes and synthesizes all her other attributes. Because of this, on this earth the Church was always called the Church Militant, in accordance with the words of the Lion of Judah, who taught. If the world hates you, know that it hath hated me before you. If you had been of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. In principle, such spiritual militancy is applied against the errors that attack the faith and attack any part of the Catholic Church, both internally and externally. This spiritual militancy, however, is not complete unless it is also reflected in the temporal sphere. Catholic states and, in general, Christendom, have the right and the duty to defend their institutions, laws, and customs inspired by the Church. On her part, the Church should orient and influence the state to this end. So there are two things that are especially hated by the progressivists. First, the spiritual militancy of the Church against heresy and error. Second, the influence of the Church over the state, which translates her spiritual militancy into temporal militancy in its laws, customs, and institutions. Unfortunately, the two popes who made the council, John XXIII and Paul VI, were among the main promoters of the abolition of Catholic militancy. What are some of, of the landmarks in their actions that, at the Council, started to eradicate the past militancy of the Catholic Church? At the beginning of the Council, John XXIII made light of communism, which was the main enemy of the Church in the 20th century. He said, We have more to do than throw stones at communism. On another occasion, Pope John XXIII said, referring to communists, They say they are enemies of the Church, but the Church does not have enemies. In 1963, 
in the opening speech of the second session of Vatican II, shortly after being elected Pope, Paul VI revealed his opposition to the combative nature of the Catholic faith. Indeed, he affirmed, We do not want to make our faith a cause for controversy. Later on, only in 1965, in the opening speech of the fourth and last session of Vatican II, Paul VI stressed how the conciliary, conciliary spirit is opposed to the militancy and honorability of the Church. towards those who still inflict so many sufferings on the Church, this Council, instead of pronouncing condemnations against them, whoever they might be, will have only sentiments of goodness and peace. Passing from words to facts, on the day before the closing of the Council, December 7, 1965, Paul VI reformed the Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office and abolished the Index of Forbidden Books. Here I pause for an explanation. Since the Church is a spiritual society, her way to defend herself against errors and heresies is not to send the police to arrest a person it put him in jail but rather she issues a doctrine of condemnation to warn the faithful that this or that doctrine is wrong and that this or that person is excommunicated or expelled from the church as a heretic. So, during her entire existence until this act of Paul VI, the Catholic Church had in each diocese of the world an organ to watch for those who would attack the purity of her doctrine, and a tribunal to condemn the dogmatic and moral doctrines that were not compatible with her teaching. The apex of this hierarchy of vigilance, judgment and punishment was the sacred congregation of the Holy Office at the Vatican which directed all these organs and tribunals. The Holy Office also had the power to intervene in any organ of the Vatican or of the entire Church to check whether the actions and documents issued by those organs were in accordance with the Catholic faith. It was, therefore, the most important organ of the Church after the papacy. The reform of the Holy Office in 1965 extinguished the militant character of that organ and transformed it into a mere academic organ to discuss doctrine. Its place of importance was given to three organs that started to promote union with schismatic and heretics, Jews and Muslims, pagans and atheists. These three organs, in charge of ecumenism and dialogue, set the tone for the Conciliar Church, a tone diametrically opposed to the predominantly militant tone of the Catholic Church from her birth until Vatican II. Now then, by abolishing the militant character of the Holy Office, Paul VI struck a decisive blow against the militants of the Church. That action signified that freedom of thought and expression was established inside of the Church. Henceforth, anyone could think, say, or write whatever he wanted without the fear of anathema. That is, Everything unorthodox, immoral, and dishonorable that has been said and written regarding the Holy Mother Church from that time until today was in effect, in effect 
permitted by the Pontifical Authority of Paul VI in 1965. Some years later, <clears throat> in 1969, Paul VI himself described how the militant character of the Church was abolished, describing her past in a very offensive word, in very offensive words. He said, We will have a period in the life of the Church of greater liberty, that is, of fewer legal obligations and internal inhibitions. The former discipline will be reduced, arbitrary intolerance and despotism abolished, the prevailing laws simplified, and the exercise of authority tempered. Later on, John Paul II was also very clear when he described the end of the militants of the Church caused by Vatican II. He was addressing the writers of the famous Jesuit magazine La Civiltà Cattolica. Initially, the comportment and style of the magazine were combative and frequently sharply controversial in accordance with the climate of tension, if not outright confrontation, which was general. Today, the situation has changed very much. With Vatican II, the Church wants to establish a dialogue inspired only in love and truth with all men. In the wake of these censures of Paul, Popes John XXIII and Paul VI, many prelates followed suit and made offensive condemnations of the past militancy of the Church. Patriarch Maximus IV said this about one of the documents offered for discussion in the Council. This schema pleases me enormously. It is the sign that we are finally leaving the fruitless period of controversies so harmful to our theology and our spirituality. In another conciliar meeting, the same patriarch affirmed. The comparison of the church to an army in battle array is not at all opportune. This triumphalism does not find any base in the gospel. It raises the risk of giving a false idea of the church. Cardinal Suenan was one of the four moderators directing Vatican II. He offended God when he addressed the topic of whether the Council should condemn communism. He accused the traditional doctrine on God as a caricature and garbage. It is not a matter of condemning atheism. What is needed is to look into its causes, which is a false image of God that men reject, a caricature that should be denounced. Christians made an idol of God, a caricature of God. Before condemning atheism, it behooves us to know which God it wants to destroy. The God who finds himself in the beginning as an architect in repose, as one who explains and covers for the ignorance and incapacity of man, the one who now guarantees the established order, who tells the poor to be patient and impedes social reforms, this God is the opiate of the masses. We can analyze various caricatures of God. To cite only one, we think of the caricature of God as providence, who providentially saves us from some disaster, but permits the same disaster to happen to another. It is a type of garbage providence. It is quite understandable that this God should die. During the Council, Cardinal Joseph Baron, Archbishop of Prague, made these violent remarks about the condemnation of the heresiarch John Huss. He raised the notion that the reason his country, Bohemia, was dominated by communists 
was a punishment for condemning us, he affirmed. In my country, Bohemia, the church today seems to be making expiation for the faults and sins that were committed in her name in times past against liberty, such as the case of the burning of Father Jan Hus in the 15th century. Father Yves Congar, who collaborated in writing many documents of the Council, qualified the Crusades, one, one of the most glorious pages of Catholic history, as an abomination. I close this part with the offensive words of John Paul II in a letter addressing cardinals in 1994. In one paragraph, he condemned all the past militant attitude of the church. He wrote, How can one be silent about the many forms of violence also perpetrated in the name of faith, wars of religion, tribunals of the Inquisition, and other forms of violating the rights of persons. It is significant that coercive methods, harmful to human rights, were also later applied by totalitarian ideologies of the 20th century, as well as by Islamic fundamentalists. This idea that the past militancy of the Church was totalitarian and fundamentalist is very present in the offensive words Pope Francis constantly uses when he refers to traditionalists. When we speak of sacrality of the Church, we are talking about that solemn and elevated atmosphere that normally surrounded Catholic ceremonies. Among those many, many sacred ceremonies, the most important ones are those related to the Mass and to the Pope. Regarding the Mass, in 1963, Vatican II approved the Constitution Sacrosanctum Concilio, which had been prepared by a commission under the direction of Father Annibali Bonini, who later was the architect of the new Mass. Thus, from 1963 onward, many liturgical reforms were unleashed. We saw the altar rails and pulpits removed, the statues of Our Lady and of the saints taken from the churches, the confessionals also disappeared, guitars and pop songs were performed during Mass under the pretext of adapting the church to the wall. After 1969, when the Novus Ordo Missi was imposed by Paul VI, Almost everything changed inside the sanctuary. The masses start to be said with the priest turned toward the people and no longer to God. This implied the abandonment or destruction of the central altar turned toward God and replaced by a table turned toward the congregation. New churches were built no longer with their plan drawn in the form of a cross to remind the faithful of our Lord Jesus Christ's redemption, but rather in extravagant forms, always with the table at its center, surrounded by the people. Allegedly, to make the Mass more accessible to the public, Latin was abandoned as a liturgical language, and the, the vernacular was adopted. Lay people, often women, started to direct the dialogue mass and to encourage the assembly to participate in the liturgy. Lay people were considered equal to the priest who was gradually pushed to a secondary place in the mass. Based on the council 
the priest was presented as the servant of the people of God. The celebrant became the, the mere presider of the assembly. The Holy Eucharist lost its central part in the Mass. Instead, the interaction of the assembly, now also called communion, took its place. As a consequence, the tabernacles lost their central place in the main altars of the churches and were transferred to side chapels or secondary walls. As the enthronement of the people became the central part of the liturgy, modern and vulgar customs, art and language replaced the traditional respect shown for the altar and the Mass. Thus, the atmosphere of the Novus Ordo Mass and the churches were increasingly emptied of a supernatural presence and blessing. In this volume, there is a long list of offenses in the various phases of the application of these reforms. Regarding the papacy, there was also an enormous amount of changes. A symbol of the papal royalty was the triple crown, the tiara. The Pope used to wear the tiara when he was elected and in very solemn circumstances. It represented the three powers the Pope has in a supreme degree, the power to govern, to teach, and to sanctify. Paul VI abolished that symbol. He sold a tiara to give the money to the poor, the same pretext that Judas gave to oppose the homage uh, Mary Magdalene made to our Lord when she glorified him by washing his feet with a very expensive perfume. Paul VI also abolished many other symbols of the papal royalty. He wanted to destroy that glorious past of the Church in order to present the Catholic Church as a democracy and no longer as a monarchy. The other conciliar popes continued on the same path, and Pope Francis is doing his best to destroy any remnant of sacrality that still remains in the papacy. For special ceremonies, either indoors or outdoors, the Pope used to be transported in the sedia gestatoria, a portable throne carried on the shoulders of 12 footmen. Some scholars believe this custom went back to the beginning of the church when the popes were elected by the clergy and the people of Rome. After being elected, the new pope was carried on a chair on the sh shoulders of the people and paraded around the square. The system of electing the pope changed, but the sedia gestatore continued throughout the centuries as a symbol of the glory of the papacy. John Paul II abolished that glorious symbol and replaced it with the preposterous Pope Mobile, which has no solemnity at all. Parallel to these actions to destroy the sacrality of the Church, there is a massive number of offensive texts that I report in Volume 2. In conclusion, this video assessed what the spirit of the Council is. It also explained the general method adopted in this Volume 2 and followed in Volumes 3, 4 and 5 of this collection. As you have seen, it gave examples of what the Conciliar Popes have done to offend and destroy the militant character of the Catholic Church. Next, 
an explanation of sacrality was offered, along with examples of offenses made by prelates against it. Finally, some instances were shown on how the Mass and the papacy have been offended and vilified after Vatican II. Reading Volume 2, Animus Injuriandi 1, you will find many other fields where outrages against the Catholic Church were made by progressivist popes, high-placed prelates, or theologians. Although several topics were not addressed in this presentation, I believe that what was demonstrated in this video offers a good start for you to begin to realize the many offenses made against the Holy Church in the name of Vatican II. I close wishing you a good and fruitful read.